Thank you. It's a, a pleasure to be here today and to uh, represent engineering sciences in class three. Um, I come to you, uh, someone who's trained classically as an, an engineer, um, but also as someone who had a fairly serendipitous path into science and engineering. Uh, I grew up in a very small town in rural North Dakota. And it was a community where lots of extended family, families knew one another. Uh, growing up in the, the 80s, in that decade, we were all encouraged to be very active. I enjoyed my science classes, my math classes, but I also played sports. I played uh, music and orchestra. Uh, I was involved in leadership and government. And I'd never met a scientist or an engineer other than a few science teachers that I had. And so it was fortuitous that just on some conversations, people told me, well, you should think about an engineering degree if you like math and sciences. And I ended up going to Purdue University for my undergrad degree. And I think what made all the difference in the world was along my path, I ran into various mentors who exposed me to opportunities. Uh, while my parents were very supportive of education, uh, they couldn't mentor me along the way about what scientists could do and what engineers could do. And so I was fortunate that these faculty, people like Nicholas Pepys, Chris Bowman, uh, Bob Langer, took the time to really advocate and expose me. And uh, to them, I'm, I'm very thankful. Uh, and so what that did was it led me along a path where I have these, I got this strong engineering background and fundamentals, but I also was exposed to how engineers could collaborate across disciplines. And I collaborate with biologists, biochemists, uh, medical doctors. And we're very interested in this area of how we can design different types of material systems that can be used to coax the body or to coax cells or deliver molecules that can help treat disease or regenerate tissues when these processes go awry. So here's just a, a little schematic that I'm showing. So if these are a cell, if this is a cell residing in a tissue, it's embedded and surrounded by a matrix. And that matrix gives the cells lots of cues to tell it that I'm in a healthy state or I've been injured and now go along and heal this wound if you've cut yourself or you've broken a bone. But what we try to do is when an injury occurs and healing's not occurring properly, how can we intervene and design systems that could complement or intervene and coax tissues to regrow? So a scaffolding, a synthetic extracellular matrix, a synthetic material that could give cues to those cells. And here I'm showing a piece of cartilage tissue that we've regenerated in our lab. So many of you may know people that have had total joint replacements. Um, but the reality is, is that many of us have extra cartilage tissue in our bodies. And if you have extra cartilage tissue, you have extra healthy cartilage cells. So the problem becomes, when your cartilage is damaged, for some reason there's no signal to tell it to heal itself. Because your cartilage doesn't have a blood supply, and it has, uh, doesn't have a nerve supply. So you have the healthy cells, I just need to figure out a way to deliver those cells to the damaged site and get that to regrow. And to this day, we have successful strategies for regrowing cartilage, helping bones heal faster, commercial products for regenerated skin to help patients who have had diabetic ulcers or severe burns. But there are still many challenges. It's very difficult to repair motor neurons. It's very difficult to repair or grow a tissue that has a metabolic function, like if you have diabetes and I want to regrow a small pancreas or a subunit of a pancreas that could generate your own insulin so you wouldn't have to have daily injections. 
We're far away from that, but yet advances in biology and cell biology are teaching us where we have lots of resident stem cells in our bodies. We're learning how to take our own skin cells and make them into induced pluripotent stem cells that can make all the different kinds of cells for the diseases like Parkinson's disease when you've lost most of the neurons in your brain that make dopamine. But that's only part of the puzzle, and we think that another part is designing material systems so that once you have those cells, they can integrate into the body and regrow in an effective manner. So, even though we can regenerate cartilage and many of these tissues, oftentimes they aren't quite perfect. Their mechanical properties might be inferior to the native tissue. Or maybe the regenerated skin uh, lacks hair follicles or pigmentation or it's not properly innervated. So this makes us step back, and what we're very interested in doing is trying to figure out what signals are necessary for those cells as we try to regrow, regenerate more complex tissues, uh, regenerate tissues that have superior performance and properties. And that brings us back to a lot of basic biology questions. So how do I know what signals need to be in place? One way you might think about this is we aren't necessarily trying to reproduce everything that the body does when it's growing and developing, but instead what we're trying to do is think about how simple is complex enough? How much information do I need to give? And the types of materials and matrices that we work with, one kind that we work with, are these hydrogel systems here. This is just a macroscopic picture of a hydrogel. A hydrogel, a contact lens is a hydrogel. A piece of jello in your, that you make in your kitchen is a hydrogel. Hydrogels are materials that imbibe large amounts of water. So what happens is if you could look under a molecular microscope and see the detail inside of this material. What you would see would be macromolecular long chains, like a piece of a spaghetti noodle, that normally that would just dissolve in water, but because of interactions between those chains, it renders them insoluble. And so it looks like a three-dimensional mesh in space that imbibe large amounts of water, which imparts lots of really good properties because many of the so cells and the soft tissues of our body, they have lots of water, and they're very elastic. Uh, that mesh size also in the water content lets these cells communicate to one another and secrete factors, and they can readily diffuse some of the transport properties that engineers are interested in. And because of their optical transparency, when I load them up with cells, I can look at them under my microscope. And here I've just fluorescently labeled some neural precursor cells that we work with. And we can watch these cells and watch how they uh, respond to signals in that hydrogel environment and learn something about which cues are necessary for the particular cells and tissues that I'm trying to grow. So that's where a lot of the engineering comes into play, because you take an incredibly complex problem, and rather than trying to recapitulate every single detail in the process, you try to find out on several time scales and size scales, all the way from the size of a single cell to a macroscopic tissue, from the instant that I assemble this to watching the tissue grow over several days and weeks, and figuring out what are the governing principles so that I might be able to coordinate and manipulate this and more successfully regenerate tissues. So uh, one of the ways that my group is particularly interested in doing that is since we can observe and watch cells inside of these hydrogels, we can come in with different types of chemistries and manipulate the environment around a cell, change it, make something different about the density of a signal that it receives or the stiffness of its environment, a physical signal, and watch how the cell responds. 
And so we think about these dynamic niches, and I'm going to tell you about two different thing, ways that we think about this. Is one, I want to be the experimenter, the manipulator, where I'm going to watch the cells in my laboratory under the microscope, and I'm going to use light and modify the region right around that cell and watch how it responds. From that, I can learn how that signal influences cells. And then the second is that I want to be the observer. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to have a model of how cells naturally behave in tissues and watch how they interact and remodel this environment so that I could maybe learn something about how to manipulate that. So let's look at these user-dictated systems. And I'll just tell you one example to put this into context. So you had a collaboration with a biologist, Leslie Lindwan, who's interested in heart disease, and uh, Don Heisted, a faculty member, an MD, who treats patients that have heart valve disease. And so we're very interested in this question or problem of what happens when you get diseased valves. So you're, this is a picture of an aortic heart valve, and it's open. So in our heart, in the human heart, we have four valves. They're responsible for directing flow in our hearts. And it's a pretty amazing tissue in that it has to open and close 60 to 80 times a minute and last our lifetime. And it's a very thin, delicate tissue, only two to 300 microns thick. So what it does when it's opening and closing is the cells inside here are responsible for maintaining and repairing this tissue. But sometimes something goes wrong with those cells, and instead the tissue becomes very thick and stenotic. And sometimes it'll even calcify. And when that happens, it doesn't open and close properly, and you have to have a valve replacement at that stage. Now, valve replacements can be very successful surgeries, uh, but they aren't without limitations. Sometimes if you have a synthetic valve, you have to be on anticoagulants for the rest of your life. And if you have a tissue-based valve, usually they have to take the cells out of that tissue so you don't have an immune response. And the tissue itself can last as a, as a valve surrogate for several years, but eventually it wears out because it, it can't remodel. So we're interested in trying to understand the basis of this because, one, what if you could tissue engineer a valve, and potentially you'd have a living valve that could be used as the replacement, and that could be especially beneficial for children that have heart valve, are born with heart valve defects because they grow over their life and they have to have many valve replacements. But it might also help us figure out, is there some type of drug that we could give somebody to reverse this process if we understand what's going on? And indeed, some of the things that go on, if you look at the, the details of the cells inside of these valves, one of the things that come, happens is look at the red marker here. This is a protein that's made by the cells that makes them in an activated state. And it says there's wounding around here repair this tissue, make lots of tissue. But when it's in a healthy state, it doesn't need to have much of this activation. And it's this high level of activation that leads to disease. So let me just show you one little picture here. So part of the problem was trying to study these cells inside of your heart is that the classic way that the biologists would study and culture cells is they remove them from the tissue, digest away the tissue, take out the cells, and put it on tissue culture, plasticware, which is made of polystyrene, like many of the drinking cups that we have. And what happens to these cells when you do that, if you take them out of the tissue, and they become activated. They behave like they're wounded. So they get turned on, and this is called a myofibroblast. And this happens in about 24 hours. You have all these myofibroblasts, and they snap, and they'll form these little nodules, and those nodules will go on and calcify. So this can be a really good model if you'd like to study heart valve disease, but if you'd like to be able to control this activation and deactivation to maybe treat disease, it's really hard to do in this context. 
So here's one simple thing that one can do just by culturing these cells in a more physiologically relevant biomaterial environment. I won't go into the details here. This isn't so important. But now we're able to characterize with high efficiency all of the different genes that these cells express when they're in a disease state or a healthy state or whether they're in tissue culture, plastic rail, or whether they're in my biomaterial environment. And so let's just look at a few and look at the patterns here more. These are the cells that are inside the valve that have never been taken out. And here's one pattern of their genes. Here's what happens if I take them out of the tissue, but I don't put them on tissue culture plastic rail. Here's that very similar pattern. But here's what happens when you put it on tissue culture plastic wear. Six orders of magnitude stiffer than a valve tissue. And just by doing something simple. So how simple is complex enough? We can begin to recapitulate patterns that look more similar to this. So we can start to think about an in vivo culture platform for these valve cells. And now we use this type of information to add back in to see how close we can get to this. And we use our dynamic material environments to do things like, here, here's my hydrogel here. And I bring in a light. And what this light allows me to do is soften that material. So I can measure the softness or the stiffness of the material using a little mechanical device, a rheometer. And that tells me how stiff this material is. And when I expose it to light, it softens. And I can measure that softening with time. And the softening rate depends upon the light. But the unique experiment that you can do is you can have stiff materials and then soften it and take away the light. And so now I can have cells in a new soft environment and watch how they respond to this. And to make, since my time is, is short today, the story here is that we're learning ways that how these cells and their activation actually respond to stiffness. And it's giving us a new cue to target for different drugs to try to reverse valve disease. So I'll skip through this part, because I want to tell you about the second part. And that is we are also interested in material systems that we can be the observer and watch how cells remodel their environment and how they would do this in a native tissue-like system, but in vitro. And for that, we look at what is the natural matrix that cells are found in. And it's a complex milieu of many different protein molecules. Uh, collagen is present. Usually there's polysaccharides called uh, proteoglycans. Different tissues have elastin. But some of the key features of these molecules inside uh, healthy tissues is that beyond just being like our hydrogels and having elastic-like properties and a high water content, they give chemical cues and information. And here, some of those chemical cues, cells bind to these matrices, and they bind with them with specific integrins, receptors on their surface. And that gives them survival cues, and it tells them whether they're in a stem cell niche or should be in a wounded environment. There are also regions within these proteins that cells can decide, I need to degrade this material so that I can migrate through. And then there are other regions within our body. It's like a, a drug factory. It's a reservoir for all different types of growth factors that cells release on demand when it's required for maintenance of tissues. So we mimic these aspects by putting in short peptides that capture key aspects of the whole proteins. So proteins are hard to, to work with, and it, it's difficult to make them with the same functionality that's maintained in vitro. But short peptide sequences that are critical parts of those proteins can serve as somewhat mimics of this. And so the idea is that I use a synthetic part, that mesh size of the hydrogel, to control physical, mechanical cues that are important in tissues. And I use the peptide part and the signals to incorporate signals that specific cells will attach to, or other types of cells can degrade, 
are, are important to activate or deactivate as a growth factor signal. And then I can look for hits of, of a certain property. So let me just show you quickly one example here where these small dots here are cells embedded in these types of hydrogel systems. And I'm looking at low magnification at living cells under the microscope. And we're going to track them over 24 hours. You can watch how these cells are spreading and attaching and migrating through this material environment. So we've just used simple peptide analogs. If I happen to misspell my peptide here and I replace this W, tryptophan, with an A, alanine, the cells can still survive in this environment, but they can't move and degrade this as well. So you can design different hydrogel matrices that will allow only certain cells to infiltrate. Well, why is this important? Because many times, loading up hydrogel systems with growth factors can be a really important thing in dictating healing. But you don't want those growth factors to dose out into the, the body and have nonspecific effects. So you only want the migrating cells to encounter that. And so here's just one quick example where we can show bone regeneration in a critical size defect that won't heal. And using the gels that cells can't infiltrate very well, you get very little healing. But using the ones that cells can infiltrate, you can almost completely fill this gap and regenerate bone. So there are ways we can coax and get materials to heal faster. So in closing, I think the main points I'd like to say is that we're really starting to learn and collaborate more with stem cell biologists, with people discovering new types of molecules, people interested in designing two types of matrices. And the challenges are figuring out how, which signals to recapitulate, how to do this in a more complex environment, and using our in, uh, engineering discipline to, uh, to, to be able to analyze this. And so I'd like to just acknowledge my great group of collaborators and, and members past and present. And if there's time, I'd be happy to answer questions.